frustration for me was how in the world I'd ever become a Baptist preacher with a name like Nut. No church would want a pastor who was a Nut. <laughs> but I found several who had them. And uh, they were all Baptists. <laughs> so I uh, decided to stay with them. It's really good to be home. Aren't you glad to be back? This is a... In Texas, I grew up planning to be a Baptist preacher. Was licensed to the Baptist ministry two weeks after my 13th birthday. According to Texas law and Baptist custom, and those are usually synonymous, <laughs> uh, I could legally perform weddings in the eighth grade. <laughs> I never did do that, <clears throat> but uh, I was I was popular in high school. <laughs> And it was fun. I grew up as a Baptist teenager in a family that was dominated by a very large father. Now, I have large hands. Uh, I can play a spread 12th at the piano. That's from a C at my little finger to a G at my thumb. I can reach that far and actually play it. Of course, the music never calls <laughs> for a spread 12th. And uh, I have found that it is a burden, a burden to have a talent that you can't use. <laughs> And my father's hands are exactly that long, but much wider and much heavier. Dad weighs 310, he wears a size 22 wedding band. Now, we were obedient children. Uh, <laughs> Dad never used a switch or a belt. Just a forefinger at the back of your head, <laughs> like that. <laughs> Which may be why I decided to be a preacher at age 13. Uh, I just knew he wouldn't hit a man of God. <laughs> He always did. He was very impartial. <laughs> Eleanor and I met just before she came to Baylor University as a freshman. I was a second year junior, I believe it was. And, um, well, two of my happiest years in college were as a junior. I, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, we met just before she came to Baylor, and we used to court all the time on a fire escape at a Baptist church across from the campus. We'd go up on the fire escape and turn out a floodlight and have devotionals. <laughs> I was devoted to her and she was devoted to me, which was very helpful. <laughs> Baylor had kind of an interesting, uh, kind of an interesting atmosphere. The, they were sort of against passion there, publicly, but very much for it in private. And uh, they, you weren't permitted to snuggle, bunny hug, kiss goodbye on the porch or anything. So you had to, you know, sneak around. But they made it rough on you. They kept the hedge, hedges cut about that high all over the campus. <laughs> which was tough on ministerial students without cards. You just, it was hard to find a place for devotionals. <laughs> and uh, I was planning to be a minister and Eleanor came to Baylor and we met and uh, fell madly in love with each other. And those were really good years. I, I don't uh, suppose we will uh, look back on it with too much regret. Didn't argue, we didn't fuss. She says that we both agreed with me, <laughs> which is probably true. Eleanor, come and join me a minute, please. I want you to get to see my wife. <laughs> Anyhow, this is my sweetheart. This is Eleanor. Happy birthday. <laughs> we do this at home a lot. We just come in and dress up and sit down. <laughs> and then I go in the kitchen and scrub the floor with my heel. <laughs> I wanted Eleanor to look like a really sexy Puritan. You know? High necks, no makeup, and all that kind of stuff. No nail polish. I was fiercely opposed to nail polish. We would go out to a dinner I was to speak for one evening, and I came in, and Eleanor was sitting on the sofa with this bright red taffeta cocktail dress on the door with a scoop neck to it and sequins all over it, and was sitting on the sofa painting her nails with 12-foot strokes. I mean, just... <laughs> and I stood there in disbelief. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> she looked up at me and said, I am polishing my nails. And went right on. And since that day, I've absolutely fallen in love with that woman all over again. I didn't really know what happiness could be like until she started giving me occasional thunder. I didn't know what it could really be like to have to deal with problems instead of issue orders. And it got over into raising our children. I suddenly began to discover that sometimes I needed to go in and kneel down beside the bed and hug Perry or Toby and say to them, I really was wrong when I did such and such today. Could you forgive me? I also discovered that it was important to affirm my children for their strengths, not just because they could run fast, throw a ball far, jump high, or do well in school, but just for being neat people. 
And I had to learn to occasionally catch them at an off-guarded moment and just hug them real good and say, man, I love you. No success in the world can compensate for failure at home. <laughs> and I really believe that. I would say that my sons have been more fun as teenagers than they've ever been in their lives. I, we, have, we have loved them and enjoyed them. And uh, another thing that I feel is that, that far too many children do not get enough freedom when they're with their families to learn how to use it when they're away from their families. So I've tried very hard to, to give the boys uh, virtual freedom to decide and do and choose things for themselves since I felt they were old enough to handle some of it and while I was still there to take the licks in case they boo-booed. But I'll, uh, I'll turn loose of an 18-year-old son comfortable about whatever he decides to do, and I, I think I can be very grateful for that. I went to a little Baptist college out in West Texas, Wayland, W-A-Y-L-A-N-D, Baptist College, Plainview, Texas. Uh, conservative little old school. Had to sign a pledge card to get in Wayland College, and I'm not making this up. I'm embellishing it a little, but I'm not making this up. <laughs> Pledge card had four parts to it. First part, you pledged that you wouldn't smoke. Now, that was even if you caught on fire. <laughs> you wouldn't smoke. <laughs> Second part, you wouldn't drink. And they didn't say what. You're just supposed to know. <laughs> well, I was a pretty serious kid. I signed a pledge that said I wouldn't drink, and I tried to keep it. I made it three and a half days. <laughs> I couldn't get down the hall without holding on doorknobs. I was weak, nervous, trembly. I was standing there one afternoon just absolutely about to faint from exhaustion. I couldn't even swallow. I was so serious, you know. And uh, president of the Ministerial Association, now this is young guys planning to be preachers that are already talking odd for God. You know, these weird, spooky dudes. And uh, <clears throat> I was one of them, I know, man. So this guy, old Bruce, comes over to me, had a big, thick Bible under his arm with four colors of ribbon hanging out and 19 paper clips on the top edge, you know. <laughs> looking just as serious as he could. He came over to me with a burden on his heart. <laughs> Put his hand on my shoulder and said, Grady, <laughs> what's your burden? You know, kind of like that. And I kind of broke under the pressure, you know, and I said, Bruce, I've got to have a drink. <laughs> it nearly scared him to death. It really did. <laughs> Poor old Bruce nearly fainted. He backed off, wouldn't touch me. You thought I had a bell on yelling, unclean, unclean. <laughs> And he backed off and looked at me and said, you drink? <laughs> I said, yeah, man, don't you? He said, no. I said, what do you do, sweat and lick your lip? You know, I'm dying. I'm dying. <laughs> but you wouldn't smoke and you wouldn't drink. <clears throat> and third part, you wouldn't dance. Now, I don't know if you know much about Baptists or not, but, buddy, they were uptight about dancing when I grew up. Some of them still are. But that was almost unpardonable sin. The basic attitude in church. Now, I wasn't putting exactly these words, but this is the message you got. If you've got a choice, and that's the way preachers would say it. You know, <laughs> you've heard them, I can tell. If you've got a choice between sin and dancing, sin. But don't dance, man. Whatever you do, don't dance. So you wouldn't smoke and you wouldn't drink and you wouldn't dance. And fourth part, you wouldn't want to. <laughs> And that was when I got in trouble. I was caught wanting to. And uh, <laughs> Dean called me in his office with a lump in his throat and a tear on his cheek and said, Grady, you've been caught wanting to. And it scared me to death. And I asked him how they could tell. <laughs> he said, sweating in February. <clears throat> he just... Now here's he Hawk, <clears throat> very old prime minister of humor. Reverend Grady in the <laughs> air. Uh, Church, uh, we throw around a lot of big words like sanctification and justification. <clears throat> uh, words, you know, that little bitty kids don't understand. You know, huh? why is that, Mama? You know? At one time, my son Toby made a list of all the words he didn't understand in church, and I was amazed. By phonics, he got out some great stuff. But pe children are like that. Uh, Jesus said one time, except we become as little children, we'll never see the kingdom of heaven. A lot of people going to miss it on that basis because they're not like children. Children just believe it. They listen to it. They, work, they ask you questions. And they misunderstand. A little kid comes into church one day and told his mother that he just learned something neat in Sunday school. What was that? Found out what God's name is. What is that? Howard. He misunderstood the words, Howard be thy name. Uh, they misunderstand other phrases in the Lord's Prayer, and I've got a collection of cute, cute little things that people have told me their kids said. Kid says one day in his prayer, lead us not into Penn Station. And Another one he plays, give us this day our jelly bread. <clears throat> so, <laughs> listen, kids just do that. The favorite one I picked up recently, uh, 
a uh, Sunday school teacher was asking the children in class one day, what were your very favorite Bible stories? And we talked to children like that in Sunday school. <laughs> and so kids are saying, well, I, like, I like David and Goliath because people are always beating up on me. And one of these, and so they're trying to identify with the character. So finally, one little kid raised his hand. He's kind of this little kid that just even chewed gum slow. And just kind of lays in, laid back. And she looks around and she says, what is your favorite Bible story? And he said, I like that one about the multitude that loafs and fishes. <laughs> I grew up in a group that was way on out from Southern Baptist, more than conservative. We were weird. <laughs> there is a difference. This group believes Southern Baptists, if they did get to heaven, would spend their time waiting on tables for the rest of us, you know, is that kind of thing. But I grew up in this group where it was a fairly typical conservative kind of heritage, and Baptist in that time of almost any persuasion believed that if they could keep a kid at church, he wouldn't have time to sin. So like most Baptists, I learned to sin at church. And uh, <laughs> learned from experts. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's just really cool. One basic difference between Baptists and Methodists, I think I should clarify at this point, being a Baptist does not keep you from sinning. It just keeps you from enjoying it like the Methodists. That is the basic difference. <laughs> now the Methodists, bless their hearts, are strange. I grew up around Methodists at home, didn't speak to them much. Because, <clears throat> uh, you know, anybody that does it wrong can't be right. And uh, I love to tease them all the time. The word baptize, literally transliterated over into English, means to put them under till they bubble. That is what it <laughs> technically means. <laughs> John the Baptist did not wade out in the creek and throw it back on them. That was not. But he put them under. You cannot make coffee putting it by the pot, in the pot. That is very important to remember. That was pounded into my head as a youth. Now, the Methodists were wrong, and we knew that. We didn't even pray for them. We were tickled. It, you know, it'd make more room in heaven if they didn't get there, and we had every reason to believe they wouldn't. And, uh, anybody that baptizes with a daisy and a Dixie cup, you know, doo -doo -doo, cannot <laughs> really be doing it right. Some of our people are a little strange. We prove annually at our conventions that we do have some folks who believe in the separation of church and reason. <laughs> Ministers and some lay persons who follow them, who've taken the vow of ignorance. <laughs> Others who've taken the vow of arrogance. The dangerous ones who've taken the vow of arrogant ignorance. <laughs> they get elected. <laughs> Baptists have a pulpit committee. That's our approach to how God moves in selecting ministers. Pulpit committee selected by the church, prayed over, prayed for. Commissioned and sent window shopping to other churches on the slide. <laughs> we dress up nine of our best members in blue suits and silk dresses and sit them on the same row and try to make them look like they don't know each other. <laughs> Fly in in a private plane just to worship in this small church today. And what we do is we find just the right person who's got that wonderful cut of the soul, who's got a good attitude and spirit. And when the committee has agreed on this person, then we start offering him more and more money till God finally leads him to us. <laughs> we have come a long way from Route 2. A long way from paperback hymn books. A long way from pews that hated to turn loose out of you when you got up. <laughs> We've moved into air conditioning and gotten away from funeral home fans that said, see us on the back. <laughs> and I have a feeling we've gotten a long way from the simple things that Welton has mentioned to us about community and belonging. It's tough to belong to a multitude. It's easy to be part of a group of 12. Or is it tougher to be part of a group of 12 and maybe easier to be part of a multitude? I think the great test for the church is how authentically and honestly we can care for the world we can get to. And I think God has called this church in this time and in this place to teach us that you can have a noble, godly attitude toward the world around you. Please Him immensely and be voted out of your Baptist association. <laughs> it does happen. Baptists have proven through the years that they will ordain anything willing. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, that's true. How do you think I made it? Uh, 
<laughs> Anyhow, C.D. got this, got this job as pastor of this church. Well, he'd been out there just three weeks, and one of his chief men in the church died of a heart attack. And they called on C.D. to perform his very first funeral. He's a freshman in college. It's November in Jacksonville, Texas, when all the wet in the world says, let's go to Jacksonville for a while. <laughs> and it just gets <laughs> slick and gunky and sinus and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyhow... He shows up at the funeral, got stuck twice trying to get up the hill to the little church. The hearse got stuck. They had to dig them out with a fence post because <laughs> it was so muddy and everything just... Now, this is red clay mud, East mm -hmm. Texas style. You can wear your tires down, slick as back of your hand, and run through that stuff and get back on the pavement, and you're good for 4,000 miles. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, CD, you know, what do you want for Christmas? Well, run my car through the mud. <laughs> Anyhow, C.D. gets out to the deal, and he gets to the church finally. The hearse has been stuck. A couple of men just rolled their pants up and stayed out in the road, you know, moving mm -hmm. cars up and down. here. 30 minutes late getting started. The quartet sang, will the circle be unbroken like it really wouldn't? <laughs> and um, everybody, you know, it was fervent and warm and good. But nobody thought to light the heat in November, and so the church is wet and chilly, and everybody's in, you know, you know, and you all use cold at a funeral anyhow. So C.D. got in, and he got through the obituary and didn't forget any of the cousins or anything. And nervous and you know mm -hmm. got it all done just right got in the hearse got in the car cd led the procession they all got stuck again trying to get to the burial site an hour and a half to go two miles to the cemetery <laughs> finally all got there up on a little bluff where the wind's blowing the wet through the little awning they put up over the mourners <laughs> and there's no butane heaters inside in those days mm -hmm. so cd gets in and he's standing over at one side the family's seated down the rectangle there's a casket behind him and cd comes in to conduct the committal service waits till he gets the signal from the funeral director <laughs> Now, funeral directors, as you know, are opaque. Um, <laughs> that's really true. Funeral directors have coaches, uh, signals like third base coaches. You know, they stand around, they scratch their nose, and sick mm. guys get up and carry the flowers out and things like that. So, CD is standing over here waiting until he gets the signal, which is a, <clears throat> okay, that's all he got. But he knew what to do. You could take a picture of a funeral, and the, the director wouldn't be in it. He, you know, he just is in, invisible. So, anyhow, CD gets over and stands in front of the family and opens his minister's manual for the committal service. C.D. reads, the, the Lord is my shepherd, and he reads, uh, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, closes it and says, now let us pray. So everybody bows their heads, and C.D. says, <clears throat> oh, Lord. And it just goes deadly silent. Now, Baptists are not trained for silence. I don't know how many of you are Baptists or even know a Baptist. Maybe you know a Baptist who will admit it. You're unusual. But... Baptists are not trained for silence. The minute it gets quiet in church, somebody leaps on the ham and organ. <laughs> and, uh, cover up that silence, you know. Quick, who forgot what, you know? Who dropped his bulletin, you know, or something like that. So anyhow, there's nobody out there to, to, to play the organ, you know? So it's just quiet. So people wait about five seconds in church, and then they want to check it out. So they start peeking, you know. <laughs> and CD has gone. <laughs> Now, you know, they thought he wanted to be the first one back in the mud or something so he wouldn't get delayed. They didn't know what happened. They start looking. What has happened? The front of the gray wall caved in. <laughs> C.D. is in the hole trying to think of something beautiful to say besides what he's feeling in his inner self. But he's down there and he pulled a sheet of artificial green grass in with him as he went in the hole. Just, ah, you know. And so everybody's looking. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? And about that time, C.D. crawls out right in front of the widow who goes, ah! You know, boom. Dead away. That is true. I didn't make that up. Uh, ministers give up a lot of things when they enter the ministry. But first and foremost, you have to give up your natural voice. People simply will not trust you if they can understand you. We all know that. It's okay on the parking lot for you to greet somebody. How are you, Ms. Johnson? <laughs> but in the pulpit, you have to say, Oh, I have a father. Kind of thick it up. So it's... You want to sound like smoke. That's what you want to sound like. A preacher with the right tone of voice can actually get you to quit something you're not doing. Now, to me, that, that's the ultimate preaching, in my opinion. I quit dancing four times before I learned how. <laughs> so, you know. I've heard preachers use incredible logic through the years. They're preachers who believe that every number in the Bible is symbolic, even the ones at the bottom of the page. And when Schofield isn't writing on the bottom and when Thompson isn't writing up the center, somebody else is putting numbers in there that are symbolic. And I grew up in that tradition. I've heard preachers say, take chapter 2 and verse 3, that's five. <laughs> Add four horns from a goat in the book of Daniel and that's nine. 
Amen. And that means repent. And people would sit there and say, what a scholar, what a scholar. I'm sure there are some people who teach in the home economics department here who understand nutrition better than they understand how to cook. That could be possible. And there are some people who understand the nature of Holy Scripture who don't love people. And there are some ministers who can fabricate incredible sermons who don't care whether you lie in the hospital alone or live in the bewildering complexity of depression or not. How I do the truth is the essence of the Christian faith. Jesus knew that. And he learned it from a man named Joseph. I know that because Joseph heard some disturbing news just before his wedding that Mary was pregnant. That is no thrill. That's disarming particularly when she comes back with the story that she had a visit with an angel that told her this would happen. And a vision came to Mary that she would bear a child, and Mary, in her 14 or 15-year-old simplicity, didn't know what else to do but tell Joseph. And Joseph, in his probably 16 to 17-year-old maturity, had no choice but to try to believe her. According to Jewish law, he could have had her stoned. He married her. And that child grew to be the most mature person who ever walked this planet, and he understood women's pain more than any of us who vote for it ever could. And he learned it from a man like Joseph, who was more concerned about doing the truth than memorizing the rules. superficial climate here. It was a terrarium. It, it, it wasn't a jungle. Maybe under this bell jar we were all kind of living this sort of controlled climate where everything just happened in accord and all this kind of stuff. I guess the thing that makes it different here is you didn't just learn biology, you learned life. Jesus said one time the buzzards gather where the corpse is, which is another way to say there are many reasons for crowds. We don't gauge how well Baylor's doing by how big we're getting. Kind of like a brand on a new calf every now and then you look around and remember a BU's on your left hip, you know, and that's just beautiful. You know, you're glad to belong to it. And homecoming kind of lets you come back and show your brand and remind people you were here. And you kind of march around the old corral and grin and remember where they stuck it to you over there. And, you know, it's, it's beautiful to be part of the place where so many good things happened early in your life. And I look back for a thousand years, if I live that long, and I'm trying, uh, and remember that the greatest years of my life in terms of real growth and friendship and everything else happened right here. And I almost walked out because it was too big. <laughs> I suppose the thing that I appreciated most about the growing and painting times of my college years were some good healthy people on the faculty who took time to listen to me. Uh, I don't know of anybody who ever got turned on to a course who didn't first get turned on to the teacher of the course. So uh, I feel like my education came from teachers and not books. Otherwise, they would send you to a library and not a university. I think at times they were a little too strict on us when I was here. I like the freer atmosphere here, but the beautiful thing about it is most people don't realize schools can learn, you know? They don't just teach, they also learn if they're doing a good job, and I think if I could say any one good thing about Baylor, as I've seen it through the years, that the school has tried to learn, tried to learn from students. Now, that's a good tradition to establish. We're heading home in all this heat and decided that going down the road, we really needed to rig the car up in such a way that we could uh, sunbathe as we traveled. Now what this amounted to was, we filled the back seat of Ed's convertible with boxes, books, double bags, suitcases, anything that would support weight. And then we covered all of that over with a blanket. The effect was just like filling the back seat up with sand and then leveling it off. 
And when you put the top back on the convertible, right behind the driver's seat was just a level platform, even with the now top of the car. So here we have the car leveled off. We head out across West Texas, and about 10.30 in the morning, the temperature's climbing up into the 90s. We're starting to get hot and sticky in the car. The windows are down. Our hair's getting thick and oily, whipping and lashing around our heads. So I said, man, Ed, let's put the top back and get some sun. So we stopped the car, put the top back, and I crawled up first to sunbathe. I don't know if you ever sunbathed at 65 miles an hour or not. <laughs> You don't get tan, but you get there in a hurry. <laughs> and here we were blistering across West Texas in the open air. Now I'm lined up on the back of the car and I discovered two or three problems. First, you had to keep your knees doubled up all the time. If you're on your back, you had to keep them doubled up or you'd drag your heels in the wheel. If you're on your stomach, you had to keep them doubled up because if you straighten them out and hit a bump, boom, your knees went the wrong way. <laughs> so, I'm lying on the back of the car sunbathing, and when you got on Levi's with your knees bent in a high wind and hot, the back of your legs just get soggy all up in the knee, and it was just squishy soggy. And I was so uncomfortable. And on top of that, the sun is bearing down, and the wind is lashing and whipping, and your hair feels like it needs an oil change. And <laughs> I'm fighting all this, and cars would go by and kick up little teeny pieces of rocks and gravel, and they go ricochet off my chest. So after about 45 minutes, I'd enjoyed all this I could stand. I decided it was time for me to get down. I did. Elmore decided it was time for him to get up. He did. He got up on the back of the car, folded his shirt neatly, and laid it between Ed and me in the seat and stretched out to sunbathe. After about 10 minutes, he discovered the same problem I did with the bent knees. Avery decided he either had to quit or get out of those britches or something. He decided to get out of those britches. <laughs> So Avery says, hey, nuts, scoot up. So he shoves me up against the windshield. He finally finds a swimsuit down in his duffel bag. He says, that'll do, sunbathe, swimsuit. So he pulls his swimsuit out, pulls the seat back, and I could funk back against the seat. Now, you see, I'm all relaxed, so I kind of put my arm up and twist in the seat to watch this. It's going to be comical, I could just guarantee you. <laughs> now then, Avery's already gets his courage up and decides it's time to change clothes. So he gets up on his hands and knees and checks out the territory. <laughs> now he's looking as straight and as far down the road as he can. Man, there's nothing out here. He looks all the way behind him, nothing. Just a few old oil wells nodding their heads. There's one old steer out there and he isn't looking. Um, <laughs> nothing but tumbleweeds and Hershey wrappers for as far as you can see. So it's desolate territory, Avery's moment, you see. So he clears it out. Takes a deep breath, grabs his belt, undoes his good dress pants, folds them neatly, lays them in the seat, grabs his swimsuit, puts one foot in, and then discovers a major problem. It's a jockey swimsuit, and he's wearing boxer shorts. <laughs> so while I'm sitting here watching, Averett decides that he's got to do something. He decides that he'll take off the underwear and then put on the shorts. So here's Avery up in plain sight now, out in the middle of barren, bald, naked West Texas. So he gets up on his knees one more time. He checks out the road ahead. Hershey wrappers, all that stuff. And then he looks behind, nothing's behind. So takes another deep breath, hooks his thumb in the waistband, shimmies out of his underwear. He throws it in the floorboard in the front seat. He grabs his jockey swimsuit, puts one foot in. We topped a hill and went through Henrietta, Texas. 